this page here which displays information about a given article. Now an article model has many comments as you can see here. And I also have the section on the right here which displays recent articles that I can access to see the different articles. Now let's say that this page is slow at loading and I would like to improve the performance with some caching. Now you may want to consider page caching for this like I show in episode 89. But let's say you only want to cache a certain section of this page. For example, we have our recent articles on the right here. And let's say it's slow to process and fetch all these articles. And we would like to just cache this little section of the page on the right. Well, that is where fragment caching comes in handy. So let's see what's involved in adding fragment caching for this list of recent articles. So here's what that view template looks like for that article. And at the top here, you can see that I have the list of recent articles. Now to add fragment caching to this is very easy. All you have to do is call cache and then wrap that in a block and just place whatever you want to cache inside of there. Now caching is disabled by default in the development environment. So if you want to test this out in development, you'll need to go to the development environment config file and change perform caching to true inside of there and then restart your Rails app. So now when I load this page again, the first time it's going to write the cache and then the next time it's going to read the recent articles from the cache instead of actually fetching them from the database. And you can see this effect if you compare the two requests in the development log file. The first request is at the top here and see here that it tried to read from the fragment cache and because no cache existed, this is going to be a miss. So it's go on, going to go on and evaluate the block which means it's going to fetch the articles from the database render out the view, and then write that to the fragment cache. Then the next time it does the request, it's just going to read from the fragment cache, see that it exists, and it's going to output that content directly into the view instead of evaluating the block. Now notice that this cache has a name, which defaults to the current URL. So this means it will write a new cache every time the URL changes, which you can see if we go to a new article here, the URL changes, but the recent article section stays the same, so we don't really need a separate cache for each separate article. We just need a single recent articles cache. You can change the name you want to use for the cache by supplying an argument to the cache call. Let's just pass in recent articles here. So now, no matter what article we go to, it will use that same fragment cache. Now, what about expiring the fragment cache? Because if I change this article, let's say I change the name of it, Notice that it changed the name of the article here, but the recent article section did not change. To fix this, we'll need to expire the fragment cache whenever an article changes. And in this case, this happens in my articles controller here inside of the update action, which is fairly standard. And whenever uh, the article updates successfully, then I want to expire the cache. And I can do that in a controller by calling expire fragment and then passing in the name of the fragment cache. In this case, it's called recent articles. Now when I try changing this article again, let's add a three at the end, update article. Now it expires that cache and so it updates the recent article section. Now scattering expire fragment around the controller can get messy. So I recommend moving this into a sweeper like I show in episode 89. All right, now we're all done with this recent article section. It caches nicely and it expires properly when we update our article. Next, I want to show you a neat trick dealing with auto expiring fragment caches. To demonstrate this, I'm going to add a fragment cache around the rest of this page, the article here and its comments. So going back to the view template, the rest of the page that I want to cache is all right here, which displays that article and its comments. So let me just cache this with fragment caching by again calling cache and passing in a block but this time, instead of a string name to pass into the cache, I'm just going to pass in the article model directly into it. Now behind the scenes, this is going to call cache key on the model and generate the cache's name based off of that. Let me show you how this works in the console. So inside of the console here, let me first fetch an article. And when I call cache key on this, it's going to return this value. Now what this includes is the name of the model, the ID of the model, and it's updated at timestamp. So this means if I change that updated at timestamp by saying something like touch on it or changing the model directly, it's going to have a different cache key, which means it's going to auto expire the cache because it's going to try to find a cache with a different name. 
So let's try this out. Reload this page a couple times to ensure that it's using the fragment cache for displaying this article. And now when I change the name here and click update article, notice it automatically expired the cache and got a new cache here because the article was changed and therefore the cache name is different. So this is really cool because when you can use this technique, it means you no longer have to litter expire fragment cache calls all around your application. However, you have to watch out for areas in the cache that might change without actually updating the model. For example, this comment section is included in the cache. So what happens if I try to make a new comment here? Click Create Comment. I've created the comment, but if I look at the comments, it still only says three comments and I don't have my new comment. So this means we'll need some way to trigger the updating of an article when one of its comments change. And Active Record provides an easy way to do this. If you have a belongs to association here like we do with our comment belongs to article, you can pass a touch option into here and say true. What this means is that when an article is changed or destroyed or created, it's going to call touch on its associated parent record. So this means it's going to update the article when a comment is changed. So this means when I try creating another comment and submit it, it's going to call touch on the article, changing its updated at column, and therefore expiring the old cache because it has a new cache name, and that means we get our new comment listed here. I hope you can see that passing a model directly into a cache key like this can be really powerful for auto-expiring it. But what about our recent articles section? We can't use this technique there because we don't have any models to work with, and I want to avoid fetching the models from the database if we're using the cache. Well, you can actually mix these two techniques for a neat effect. Nothing stopping you from nesting fragment caches. For example, for each article in this list here, we could create a separate cache here and pass that article object to it, and then just render the list inside of there. And we don't want to conflict with the article that we're passing into this cache, so we're going to have to give this cache a different name. And we can do so by passing in an array to the cache value and prefixing it with something else such as recent, and then passing that in, and that will create a unique key based off of the elements passed into the array. So here's how this works. When this recent article's cache is generated, it's going to create a new separate cache for each item in this list, in addition to the full recent article's cache. So this means normal behavior is just going to read the recent article's cache here, but if that expires by editing the article, so we'll edit this article here, then the recent article's cache will expire because of what we set up in the controller. But when it regenerates this cache, it's going to use the other caches because they have not expired for each of the items in this list except for the one that changed because that will auto expire because we changed that article. Now you probably won't see any benefit of this here because each of these items are just so simple, but if these items were more complicated and took a while to load on each one, you'd really see a nice benefit of this when you need to regenerate the cache for the full list of recent articles. Now, if you didn't grasp all of that, uh, don't worry too much. This uh, little trick isn't something you'll probably do a whole lot of. It's just a neat way to improve the performance of generating a larger fragment cache by just caching each little mini section. I want to finish up by explaining how fragment caches are stored. A Rails comes with a built-in uh, centralized caching mechanism called rails.cache. And this is just a simple key value based storage, which you can read and write from. So we can say read from a specific cache and fragment caches are prefixed with the views key and then the key of the cache itself, such as recent articles. And then just pass that in and there's the value of that fragment cache. Now the default storage for this is a file-based store, you can see here, but in production, you'll likely wanna use something different that's more memory-based, such as memcache or Redis. If you check out the comments inside of the production config file, you can see a section on here for changing the cache store uh, to memcache or whatever else you want. Uh, memcache is really nice because you can set a hard memory limit, and then when it hits that, it will just uh, delete old caches. So that way, uh, it works really well with the auto expire technique we did here, because those will likely generate a lot of new caches as the uh, records change. Well, that's all I have for this episode on fragment caching. Thanks for watching.